Hi. Uh, last time we started discussion of um, conditions of static equilibrium of a solid or rigid body. And the conditions we uh, derived could be written in such a way. First, vector sum of all forces acting on a body must be equal for the center of mass of the body to be at, at rest. And the second condition is uh, the sum of all torques acting on the body must be equal to zero so that the body does not rotate. If the net force acting on the body is not zero, then the center of mass will be accelerated according to the Newton's second law. And if the total net torque acting on a body is not zero, then the body will rotate. So these two conditions, these two equations, determine a condition for static equilibrium of a rigid body. And I would like to consider some problems related to this uh, topic. First, let's consider a uniform bar of length L and mass M, such a bar that is supported in two points. As the bar is uniform, the weight of the bar is applied to the center. So the weight of the force of attraction, gravity, gravity attraction to the Earth, mg, is applied to the center of the, of the bar so that this distance is L over 2. And let's suppose that this support is applied at a distance of L over 4 from the center of mass of this bar. And we need to find in this problem the forces of reaction, the force which acts on the first, uh, on the first supply, on the first support, on the first support, that is the force, the force uh, on, the, on the first support, there is a force acting downward, F1, and equal force is attached to the bar and directed upward, F1, the same magnitude and opposite direction according to Newton's, second, Newton's third law. And the same situation is here. The bar uh, presses against this support with some force F2, and uh, the same force in magnitude F2 is applied to the bar and directed oppositely. So according to Newton's third law, two forces, a force of action and a force of reaction, are equal in magnitude and oppositely directed and applied to different bodies. The first body is the support, and the second body is the bar. So in this problem, we need to find these two forces. F1 and F2. As the bar does not move, it is in condition of static equilibrium. We must use the main laws of static equilibrium. The first law says that the total force, the net force acting on the object, on the bar, must be equal. In order to write down this condition for uh, our problem, we must take all the forces and find the net or resultant force. Well, in order to do so, we will assume that the forces directed upward will be taken with positive sign, and forces directed downward will be taken with negative sign. So uh, the forces looking upward, pointing upward, is F1. So this condition will be F1 plus F2, the two forces acting upward, minus the force of gravity, minus the force of gravity pull mg, which is directed downward. And this sum of all forces must be equal to 0, according to the first equation. 
two forces acting upward on the bar applied to the bar and the last force of gravity pull acts downward. Now the second condition. The second condition requires to calculate, to estimate all the torques acting on the object. I remind you uh, the definition of a torque. What is a torque? In order to use this quantity, we have to remember the definition of it. The definition of a torque is uh, that the torque equals the force times the arm of the force. And the arm of the force is the shortest distance from the axis of rotation to the line of action of the force. So in order to calculate the torque, we must somehow show the arm of the force of each force. And in order to find the arm of the force, we have to determine where is the axis of rotation. Actually, we can choose any point as axis of rotation, any point which is convenient. For example, we may choose this point A as the axis of rotation, because the bar can rotate about this point. If we shift a little bit this support upward or downward, then the bar will rotate by a small angle about point A. So point A can be taken as um, axis of rotation. Then, in this particular case, for this particular axis of rotation, we have to find uh, the net torque. That is, the torque of force Mg and the torque of force F2. We don't have to calculate the torque of force F1 because this force goes through the axis of rotation, and therefore the arm of this force is zero. So we don't pay attention to this force F1. And we calculate torques for force Mg. By definition, the torque of this force Mg is the force times the arm of the force. In our case, this is L over 4. And this <coughs> term may be taken with a plus sign because Mg, this force, tends to rotate the bar clockwise. This force tends to rotate the bar clockwise about this axis of rotation. And now we go to the torque of force F2. It will rotate the bar counterclockwise. And therefore, the torque of this force will be negative. These two forces rotate the bar in different directions. So the signs of these torques will be different. Uh, the force F2 will have a torque equal to the force times the arm of the force. And the arm of the force is the shortest distance from the axis of rotation to the line of action of the force. In our case, that will be the sum of these two sections. That will be L over 2 plus L over 4. This distance will be the arm of force F2. And force F2 times its arm will be the torque of this for force. So the first term here is the torque of force Mg. And the second term here is the torque of force F2. And the sum of these forces, the algebraic sum, must be equal to 0. Why? Because the body under consideration is in static equilibrium. It, is, it does not rotate. It's in static condition. So we have these two equations. The first equation obtained from the first condition here, and the second equation obtained from here. So these two equations, as simultaneous equations, must be solved together in order to obtain the two unknown quantities. We can always uh, find two unknown quantities, F1 and F2, if we have two equations connecting these quantities. Well, from the second equation, F2 can be found as, uh, well, first of all, this coefficient in round brackets <coughs> will be equal to 3L divided by 4, obviously. And uh, so F2 will be equal to mg 
L divided by 4 and divided by 3L and again divided by 4. So 4 will cancel, L will cancel, and we obtain Mg divided by 3. So this force F2 is found as Mg divided by 3. Now from the first equation, we can easily find force F1, which will be equal to Mg minus F2. Mg minus F2. If we take these two terms to a uh, right side of this equation, then we will have Mg 1 minus 1 over 3. That will give us 2 mg divided by 3. So we have found force F1, and we have found force F2. These are the forces of reaction which, uh, which ap appear here in, appear in, in the two supports, which two supports uh, which ensure that the bar is in static equilibrium. One force is one third of the weight of the body, and another force is two thirds of the weight of this bar. That is the simple problem, and uh, I illustrated the application of the general law. This is these two equations actually constitute a law of static equilibrium of a rigid body. Now I will consider a more complicated problem, which is problem 206 of Buchovtsev. So number 206. A heavy spool with a thread wound on it lies on a rough horizontal surface. So I draw a heavy spool A spool is on the rough horizontal surface, so this is the rough surface. And the spool has a thread wound on it. So here we have a thread wound on this cylinder. If the thread is pulled in this direction, then the spool will roll and to the and move to the left, and roll counterclockwise and move to the left. To the left, if I pull the spring in this direction, uh, if I take this spool and if I take the thread and pull it in opposite direction, then the spool will rotate clockwise and move to the right. So if we pull here, then the spool moves to the left. If we pull here, then the pool moves to the right. Therefore, there must be some angle such that if we pull this thread in this direction, then the spool will not move, neither to the left nor to the right. It will not move. It will remain at rest or it may rotate if we pull strongly with a large force. Or if we pull with a uh, not very large force, then it will not rotate and it will not move. There must be some position, some, v some angle alpha, such that to the vertical, such that if we pull the string, pull the thread in this direction, the spool will not move. If we change this angle, uh, to the left, then the spool will go to the left. If we change this angle to the right, uh, then the spool will go to the right. But in this particular position, the spool will not move. So we have to find this angle at which it does not move. Uh, the problem also gives the radius. Uh, it gives the small radius r and it gives 
large radius capital R of the spool. <coughs> So we must determine this angle. So we have only two quantities given in this problem. The radius of the spool core, this cylindrical body in the center of the spool on which this thread is bound, and large radius of the spool head. So, we understand that if we pull the thread in this direction, then the spool will not move. And it will not rotate if we don't pull too hard, if we pull just gently, just applying small force. Then the spool will not rotate, neither rotate nor move. That is, the spool will be in condition of static equilibrium. If it does not move and does not rotate, then it's in condition of static equilibrium. And the static equilibrium will be achieved only if we, m if we pull the thread under some angle alpha to the, to the vertical. If we choose some different angle, then the spool will move. It will roll, and it will roll either to the left or to the right. At some definite angle alpha, it will not roll, it will remain at rest. If it's at rest, then we must use the conditions, these two equations which determine the conditions for static equilibrium of a rigid body. Here in this problem we have a rigid body, and uh, it's given in the problem that this body is at rest if the thread is pulled in this direction. So we must use the conditions for static equilibrium. In order to use the first condition, that is the net force is equal to zero, we must determine all the forces acting on our rigid body. In order to determine all the forces, we must consider all the interactions of this body with the outside world, because a force is a measure of interaction. So the spool is interacting with what outside bodies. First of all, it's interacting with the thread. And there is a force of tension of the thread. Also, there is a interaction between this rigid body and the planet Earth. And the, this interaction is the gravity pull, which is directed down, downward. And this is mg, the force applied here to the center of mass of the spool. And also the spool is interacting with, with the surface. The spool is interacting with the surface. So it's interacting with the surface in two different ways. First, there is a force of surface reaction, the force N directed upward. And there is also some force of friction. But the coefficient of friction is not given in this problem. I was trying to find it, but it's not given. So we don't know what is the force of friction. <coughs> Uh, but we can guess, because if, if we pull this string to the left and the spool rolls counterclockwise and moves to the left, then if it moves with acceleration, then the force of friction will, will be directed uh, in the opposite direction, opposite to acceleration. It will be directed to the right. If, on the other hand, we pull the string to the right, the spool will roll to the right, roll, roll count, uh, clockwise direction and roll to the right, 
And in this case, if it rolls with acceleration, the force of friction will be directed to the left. Oppositely, the vector of acceleration. If acceleration is directed to the right, then the force of friction must be directed to the left. If the strain is at angle alpha, we know by, by the statement of the problem that, this, that there is no rotation and no acceleration. Therefore, in this particular case, the force of friction is zero. If the center of mass is not rotating and not, uh, the center of mass is not accelerating and the spool is not rotating, then the force of friction is zero in our particular case. So we don't have to take it into account. <coughs> OK. We have found all the forces uh, of interest, mg and n, and the force t. We have shown these forces on the sketch. And now we can start applying the first uh, equation, equation of forces. In order, to, in order to determine this condition that the net force is equal to 0, we must consider uh, the projections of each force on some uh, axis of some reference frame. So we have to choose the axes which are convenient in, uh, in the solution of this particular problem. It's convenient to choose a horizontal x axis and vertical y axis. <coughs> so first we consider the components of all forces the horizontal components of all forces, or the projections of all forces on uh, a projection of all forces on on axis x. Well, now it now it occurs to me that the force of friction must somehow be present here. There must be some force of friction anyway. Otherwise, we will not obtain. Uh, condition of static equilibrium. So <coughs> uh, because uh, the force T has some component along x axis, and, there and other two forces have no components, no horizontal components. So the only force T can, cannot, will be unable to ensure the static equilibrium of this, uh, of this spool. So there must be present some. There must be some force of friction. Well, my first conclusion was uh, was wrong. That there should be no force of friction. There should be some force of friction. Otherwise, the bo the body. Otherwise, the spool will move move to the right. So imagine absolutely smooth surface without any friction, like an icy surface, the ice. And if you pull the spring, if you pull the string in this direction, then if there are no forces of friction, this object will, will slide to the right. It will slide inevitably to the right. So there must be some force of friction. And so we consider the components, the horizontal components of all forces. Uh, the force Mg and force An, force of surface reaction, have no, these two forces have no horizontal component. That is, their horizontal component is zero. So we don't take them into account here. And the horizontal component of force T will be T. If it's here, horizontal component is this one. So this horizontal component will be equal to T sine alpha. And I will take it with plus sign, because this horizontal component is directed to uh, the positive <coughs> towards the positive direction of the x-axis. And another force will be F which is directed to the negative part of the axis. It's pointing to the negative part, to the negative direction. So I take it with negative sign. And the sum of these two forces will be 0. According to the main law, the sum of the forces, uh, the total sum of all forces must be 0. So this, this is as far as the horizontal components of the forces are concerned. Now we consider the vertical components of all forces. In vertical component, we have the vertical component of force T, which will be this, this one. That will be T cosine alpha T 
phi cosine alpha. And another positive force which has vertical component is the force An, force of reaction plus An. And uh, another force which has vertical component is the force of gravity pull mg with a sign minus, with minus sign. And the force F will have no vertical component because all this force belongs to a horizontal line. So these two forces must be equal to these uh, three forces, the sum of these three forces must be equal to zero. Such is uh, the equation for the vertical components of all forces, components directed along vertical y-axis. Uh, so we have used the first equation here. And the second equation, equation of torques, equation of torques can be written in case we have uh, chosen some point uh, in case we have chosen some point as a axis of rotation I would like to choose this point as a point of axis of rotation point O because two forces or even three forces uh, are directed uh, in such a way that, that they will have a zero arm mg, the force of gravity, will have zero arm with respect to this axis of rotation. And uh, the force An will have zero arm with respect to this axis of rotation. And also, the force of friction will have zero arm with respect to this point of ro uh, axis of rotation. So the only force remaining will be the force T multiplied by its arm, and where is the arm of this force? In order to find the arm of the force T, we must consider the line of action of this force. And the arm of the force will be the shortest distance between the axis of rotation and the line of force action. So this section H will be the arm of the force T. And we obtain TH must be equal zero. Uh, such such is the equation of torques. The net torque acting on the body must be zero. This is a law of physics. This is a condition of static equilibrium. And in our particular case, if we choose this point as the axis of rotation, then we obtain that the force T, the force of tension of the string, times the arm of this force must be zero. All other forces will have zero arm and all other forces will have zero torque with respect to this axis of rotation, which goes uh, through point A, through point O. <coughs> well, this is an interesting turn in the solution, because from this equation, we immediately find that the force T cannot be zero, because we pull the string with this force. It's non-zero. We pull, actually, according to the statement of the problem, we pull the string with some force. So this is not zero. And from this equation, if the product of t times h is zero, then necessarily h should be zero. That is, in this problem, this arm must be zero. It means that the angle A alpha must be such that this string goes through point O. That's an interesting turn in, uh, uh, in the solution of this problem. <coughs> OK. Very good. It immediately, immediately, this observation immediately changes the solution. We don't even have to consider all three equations. We, yes, we were absolutely correct in writing down the first two equations, but all of a sudden, the last equation turns out to produce the solution immediately. I will draw the picture again. I will draw it here so that everything is quite clear. That is the spool. That is the point of contact of spool with horizontal surface. And that should be the line of action of the string. And if this is the center of the spool, then that is the small radius of the spool core 
where the thread is wound about the spool core. And this is the large radius of the spool head. And so as far as this angle alpha is concerned, the angle between the direction of the string and the vertical line, this is vertical and this is direction of the string, we immediately obtain if, if the string must go through point O, the direction of the string must, must point at point uh, at this center of the rotation O. Then sine alpha must be equal to this opposite leg R divided by hypotenuse capital R. And that defines the angle alpha. That defines the angle alpha. That will be the solution of the problem. We started, we started this problem with uh, writing the equations, all the equations we need. And then we finally suddenly discovered that we need only one equation. Only one equation gives the solution because the arm of the force T must be 0. And the, the, that defines the direction of, of, uh, of the string. That defines, and the direction of the string is defined by this condition. Now I will show you uh, such a spool. Now I will, I will show you what happens here. So there is a spool just like we considered in this problem. And so, uh, where should I pull? In this way. If I pull here in this direction, the spool turns and rolls uh, to the left of you. And if I pull in the opposite direction, the spool rolls and moves to the right. So there must be some intermediate direction, intermediate direction of the string, such that the spool is not rotating and not moving, something like this one. And we see that the angle under which we pull the string, yes, it, it's very close. I see it's very close to what we have shown on this sketch, to what we have drawn. It's actually exactly what we have found, exactly. The, the string must be directed at such an angle so as uh, the string goes through this point. Uh, the line of the string uh, should, be po should point at this uh, point of contact between the spool and the uh, table surface. That's it. We can check the solution of this problem experimentally. <coughs> we can check it experimentally. Again, if I pull somewhere in this direction, the spool rolls to the left. If I pull in this direction, the spool rolls to the right. And there is some intermediate direction such that if we pull the string at this direction, uh, the string, the, the, the spool doesn't move neither to the land, to the left, nor to the right. It appears to rotate on to rotate remaining on the same place. That's it. A small demonstration. A small demonstration related to this problem. <coughs> okay. <coughs> now I will consider another problem. Uh, another problem. So uh, as far as the conditions for static equilibrium of rigid body, as far as these conditions are concerned, uh, we have considered two problems. The first one, a uniform bar supported in two points. And the second one, the second problem, more complicated body and more complicated situation. And in each case, we had to consider the forces, all the forces, the net force acting on the body must be equal to 0 and the net torque applied to the body must be equal zero. 
these are the conditions. If these conditions are, uh, if these conditions are satisfied, if these two equations are satisfied, then the rigid body under consideration will be in static equilibrium. Now, what happens if these conditions are not satisfied? What happens if, if this is not zero? Then I told you the center of mass of the body will accelerate according to the Newton's second law. And if this net torque is not zero, then the body will rotate with some acceleration. And I will consider this situation now. I will consider the rolling up a cylinder. So we have a cylinder, which and uh, and a slope such that the cylinder may roll down the slope, and we have to find. Well, let us find acceleration of the cylinder if angle alpha is given if we know that there is no slipping in the point of contact no slipping between the cylinder and the inclined surface and also we know the mass of the cylinder and we know the radius we know the radius of the cylinder this may be a cylinder a uniform cylinder with uniform distribution of mass or it may be something like a disk with uniform distribution of mass. Last time we obtained a formula for the moment of inertia of such a disk or such a cylinder, which is mR squared over 2. And uh, if we consider the motion, the accelerated rolling of this accelerated motion of this cylinder, then we, sh we will need this quantity, this quantity of a moment of inertia. Uh, I, will, I would like to consider this problem. This problem can actually be solved in several different, uh, several, there are several different ways to solve this problem. Several different ways, several different solutions. Uh, the first solution may be consideration of all forces and all torques and writing down the equations of dynamics of this rigid body. And another solution, another idea will be discussed after a short interval. So now we have a five minutes interval.
So we continue our lecture and we consider this problem of a cylinder rolling down the slope without, without slipping. And I would like to consider this problem not from the point of view of forces and torques, but from the point of view of energy conservation. Because if, if there is no slipping, then there is no, no heating. And so therefore, there is no uh, loss of mechanical energy here. If there is no heating of, of these bodies, no, sli no sleeping, then uh, no loss, no dissipation of mechanical energy. Therefore, the mechanical energy must be conserved. And the initial mechanical energy on this level must be calculated with uh, respect to some final position of this point O. So as the cylinder rolls and moves with some acceleration here, the center of mass moves at some acceleration, and the trajectory of this point will be parallel to the slope. And uh, after some time interval, the point O will go, will take the position of point O prime. And so this cylinder will be here after some time interval. So the center of mass will descend by some height h. And therefore, with respect to the final position, the initial mechanical energy will consist of initial potential energy of this body plus initial kinetic energy. Let's assume that the initial velocity was zero, so that the initial mechanical uh, kinetic energy was zero, and the only energy in this system was the stored potential energy, which is equal to mgh, the mass of the body, times g, acceleration of freefall, which is the weight of the body, and h. This is the potential, initial potential energy of the body. And the final potential, final potential energy will be zero if we, if we uh, measure the height from this level, from this uh, final position. Then the initial height was h, and the final height will, will be zero. So the final potential energy is zero the final potential energy. And we must take into account only the kinetic energy of this body. And kinetic energy will, be, will consist of the translational motion of the center of mass with some final velocity v. And that will, be, that will give us the term mv squared over 2 plus the energy of rotational motion of this body. And rotational motion energy is moment of inertia, which is equal to this uh, expression times uh, angular velocity squared over 2. We have derived these formulas previously. So this is the kinetic energy of the translational motion of the center of mass. The center of mass moves here at some velocity v. At this position, the initial velocity was 0, and then the velocity was, uh, was larger and larger. And at this point, the final velocity is v. And so the center of mass moves at velocity v. And that gives us the kinetic energy of translational motion. But if you, if you go to a reference frame, which moves here at in this direction at velocity v. If you if you move if you move here with velocity v, then this point, the center of the cylinder, will be at rest uh, during some short interval of time. And uh, the only thing you will observe will be the only motion will be a rotational motion of the cylinder, a rotational motion with some angular velocity. And this rotational motion must, must have its energy. And the second term here uh, describes the energy of rotational motion.
also what can be taken into account here is that uh, the body moves from initial position to some final position and this displacement can be denoted as L. That is the displacement of the body in its motion. That is the distance between the initial position of the center of mass and final position of the center of mass in some time interval. That is, L is the distance between O and O prime. That is the section O, O prime. <coughs> the length of this section, the length of this section between points O and O prime. And uh, if this angle is alpha, then this is also alpha. And so the lengths L and H are somehow related. Uh, we know that if this is L and the opposite leg in this right triangle is h, then h is equal to l sine alpha. Uh, I don't know if we need it, but we may probably need this relationship between uh, l and h. <coughs> Most probably we will need it. Also, we will need some what is the relationship between the velocity of the center of mass of the disk and the angular velocity. <coughs> we derived this we derived this obtained this relationship <coughs> between the velocity v of the center of mass and the angular velocity of rotating body that will be the angular velocity times radius of the disk or radius of this cylinder this uh, formula will be uh, obvious if you go to the reference frame moving together with the center of mass with velocity v and this direction, then the center of mass will be at rest. It will have zero velocity from the point of view of the new reference frame. And the disk will be uh, just rotating. And so that, so, so that the velocity of every point, uh, every point of the disk surface, that is v, the same velocity will be here on, on the disk surface, mu will be related with the angular velocity according to this formula. We obtained this formula. We derived it. <coughs> Uh, previously. So if we if we take omega from here it will be v divided by r and we may take this expression and substitute it for omega in our first equation and the first equation is the law of conservation of mechanical energy. I have chosen this way of solution. I want to apply a law of conservation of mechanical energy. And the law of conservation says that the initial mechanical energy is equal to the final mechanical energy. And this is true if we have no dissipation of mechanical energy, no slipping, no forces, no slipping, no heating of surrounding bodies. So this is just the case. The problem says that there is no slipping. So uh, no heating, no dissipation of mechanical energy. Therefore, the initial mechanical energy is equal to the final mechanical energy. And the initial mechanical energy consists only of the initial potential energy. And the initial uh, kinetic energy is zero because the initial velocity is zero. We assume it was zero. We take it for granted because we consider such a problem when the initial velocity was zero. It's, it's given uh, in the statement of this problem. So the initial kinetic energy consists only of the initial potential energy, mgh. And the final mechanical energy will have uh, only kinetic energy. And uh, the potential energy is zero because we measure the height from this final point. At this, at this point, the height is zero. Therefore, the final potential energy is zero. And the final kinetic energy uh, consists of two terms. Uh, it uh, consists of two parts, the kinetic energy of translational motion of the center of mass and kinetic energy of rotational motion of, of this cylinder. <coughs> so if we substitute here uh, this quantity V over R, if we substitute it for omega, then we obtain 
t is the same, we obtain m v squared divided by 2 plus moment of inertia and v squared divided by 2 r squared. And that will give us uh, v squared over 2 i factor this v squared over 2. And what remains in the round brackets will be m plus a moment of inertia divided by r squared. From this equation, I can find the final velocity v, which will be equal square root square root of 2 mg h 2 mg h 2 goes as a coefficient divided by this round bracket divided by m plus i over r squared. And I know that h is somehow related to l. So I may take this uh, expression and substitute it for h here in this formula. And that will give me the following expression. That will give me a square root of 2 m g. And instead of h, I use l sine alpha. divided by m plus i over r squared. OK. That sounds very good. We have found the final velocity v as a function of different quantities. Uh, involved in this problem. This is the mass of the cylinder, the radius of the cylinder, the length which, which the length uh, which covered by the accelerating cylinder, and angle alpha, the angle of this inclined surface <coughs> of the slope. So, but I need to find the acceleration. What we actually we wanted to find this acceleration of the center of mass of the cylinder. So what is the acceleration? Where is the acceleration? We have no acceleration here in these formulas. But we may recall uh, the relationship between uh, the velocity and the displacement for a uniformly accelerated body. Uh, I, re I remind you that if you have a uniformly accelerated motion, then the displacement L will be equal to acceleration times squared over 2. And if we multiply both nominator and denominator of this formula by A, we will obtain A squared ta T squared over 2A. And that will give us what is AT? AT is final velocity squared. Certainly, final velocity squared over 2A. And from this formula, we obtain that final velocity is somehow related to the distance covered by a uniformly accelerated body. By such formula, final velocity should equal to square root of 2 L a. And we also found final velocity in our prob problem. And it uh, also is expressed through a square root of some, something like 2 and some coefficient times L, exactly what we need here. And we know that if under the square root we obtain 2L times some coefficient then this coefficient must be equal to the acceleration of our rigid body if it was moving at constant acceleration, if it was 
uniformly accelerated motion. And that is exactly the case in our situation. We had a uniformly accelerated motion uh, here. So looking at this formula <coughs> and comparing this formula with what we obtained here, we understand that everything apart from this coefficient 2 and apart from L is the acceleration. Therefore, we, we can immediately we can immediately write the formula. We can put down it for the acceleration, which must be mg sine alpha divided by m plus moment of inertia r over capital R squared. Moment of inertia i <coughs> over capital R squared. So we have found acceleration of the cylinder in our problem. Can we be sure, absolutely sure, that this answer is correct? No. Nobody can ever be absolutely sure. People are inclined to make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. So it's not, it's not, uh, uh, it's unavoidable. Everybody makes mistakes. It's unavoidable. So I could have made a mistake here, and I could, I could have obtained an um, incorrect result. How can I check the result? How can I check if this is correct or incorrect? If this formula is good or bad? There are several ways of reasoning several ways to check the correctness of this formula. First, we must check the units of measurement. We know that the acceleration should be measured in meters over second squared. What units of measurement will provide this expression? We have mass times acceleration of free fall. Sine has no units. It's a dimensionless quantity. Sign of any angle is dimensionless. Mass here in the denominator and mass in denominator must be canceled. And what about I, the uh, moment of inertia? It has the dimensions defined by this formula, mass times distance squared. So mass here times distance squared will be uh, as far as the dimensions are concerned, distance squared will, will cancel and only the mass will be in the second term. The second term here in denominator will have the dimension of mass. So it will be measured in kilograms, inevitably, because I has the, the dimension of mass times meter squared, and meter squared will be, uh, will be canceled. So the second term has the dimension of mass, and the first term has the dimension of mass. So the denominator sh should be measured uh, in kilograms. It will be measured in kilograms, and it will cancel. It will cancel the kilograms in the denominator. And the only dimensional uh, magnitude here, only dimensional quantity, will be g acceleration of free fall. Okay, this is acceleration, and its dimension will determine the dimension of the whole formula. But we we need the dimension of acceleration here because. In the left-hand side of this formula, we have acceleration. So this formula must give us the dimensions of acceleration, meters over second squared. And that's true. Mm, this dimension analysis, analysis of units of measurement, uh, suggests that the formula actually gives the required dimension, the dimension of acceleration, which is g. All other dimensions will be canceled here. That is a dimension. Dimensional analysis uh, suggests that this formula is correct. Uh, anyway, this is not um, a guarantee that the formula is correct. We must analyze the formula for a physical, uh, physical meaning or physical uh, sense of this formula or reasons behind this formula. So uh, what this formula gives us, for example, if alpha tends to zero, it means that the slope is very small. This uh, 
inclined surface is almost horizontal, then alpha is very small, it tends to zero, and we know that if the cylinder is placed on horizontal surface, it will not accelerate, or acceleration will be very small. And if angle alpha tends to zero, then the acceleration A should also tend to zero. Is this true? Yes, this formula gives exactly the same result. If alpha tends to zero, then sine alpha is also zero, it will become very small, and the acceleration will become very small. Another thing is uh, we can analyze this formula if it's correct regarding the, this quantity, uh, moment of inertia. So imagine two different bodies. The first one is this cylinder or disk with uniform distribution of mass, uniform distribution of mass. In this case, the moment of inertia will be given by such formula as written here. And imagine another body, another, imagine a disk, which is actually a hoop. It's not a disk, it's a hoop. And all the mass is distributed along this, cir along this circle. And uh, the inner side of this hoop is empty. So if this hoop has radius r, and all the mass is distributed evenly along the surface, along this, uh, along this circle, then the moment of inertia of such a body will be different. So if this is the first moment of inertia, the second moment of inertia of the second body, body number two, will be given just by the formula mass times radius squared. So the, the second moment of inertia will be larger will be twice as large as the first moment of inertia, and moment of inertia number one. Number one, the moment of inertia of the uniform disk will be twice as small as the moment of inertia of a hoop of the same mass and the same radius. So if moment of inertia here is increased, then the second term in denominator will increase, and the denominator itself will increase, and the acceleration will decrease. So the larger the moment of inertia, the smaller the acceleration, and vice versa. The smaller the moment of inertia, the larger will be the acceleration of this body. <coughs> and now imagine that the moment of inertia is zero. It means that all the mass is located in the center, and there is no rotation, and rotation can be neglected or not taken into account. If the moment of inertia is zero, it's so small that it can be neglected. Then the second term, if it's very small, it can be neglected here, and the mass will cancel, and we will obtain the acceleration equal to g sine alpha. That is exactly the acceleration for a body sliding down the slope without friction. We obtain this formula g acceleration of free fall times sine alpha for a body which simply slides down for such a bar which slides down the slope without friction. And uh, without friction means that there is no dissipation of mechanical energy, no dissipation, uh, no heating of surrounding bodies. So if the bar slides down without friction, we, up we solved this problem previously, and we know that the acceleration will be de determined by this expression, g acceleration of free fall times sine alpha. And that is exactly the result given by this formula in case the moment of inertia is very small, uh, almost zero, so small that a second term may be neglect neglected here. Then this is zero, and the mass will cancel, and we will obtain g sine alpha, what we should have obtained for such a situation. And now, I return to non-zero moments of inertia, and I see that if we take a hoop, then the moment of inertia will be larger, and if I take a solid cylinder, the moment of inertia will be smaller, and therefore the accelerations will change in reverse order. The larger the moment of inertia, the smaller the acceleration. Well, in this calculation, uh, in this formulas, the mass is the same of the two bodies, and the radius is the same. <coughs> I have taken two such bodies here with the same mass 
and the same radius. So the two cylinders, they have equal mass. It can easily be seen because they are on balances, and the balances are show you that the masses are equal. The, these two bodies have equal weights. They balance each other. They have equal weights. So they have the same mass, and they have the same radius, the same radius. Exactly what we need according to our formulas. The radius must be the same, and the mass is the same. But the distribution of masses, the distribution of mass is different. In this cylinder, the mass is distributed evenly. It's a uniform distribution of mass over the uh, cross-section of the cylinder. And here, the distribution of mass is obviously non-uniform. Practically, all the mass here is concentrated uh, along the circle, along the surface of this uh, cylinder. It may be considered as a hoop. So what do we know from the solution of our problem? We know the, that uh, the cylinder with uh, uniform distribution of mass must have uh, larger acceleration. And uh, for this body, the mass is the same, but the moment of inertia is different. Moment of inertia of this body is twice the moment of inertia of the uniform cylinder. And so the, if the moment of inertia is larger, the acceleration of this cylinder, of this uh, empty body, will be smaller. Now I will try to demonstrate this. Uh, the two bodies will be allowed to roll down uh, simultaneously along the inclined surface, along the slope, and you will see which body will have a larger acceleration. That is. Obviously, the cylinder with uniform distribution of mass, and that is smaller moment of inertia, will have larger acceleration. Again, I show you. This one must have large acceleration because more mass is concentrated at, uh, along the axis of rotation. Yes. So the uniformly distributed mass here produces smaller uh, moment of inertia, and therefore the acceleration will be larger. That is according to the solution of our problem according to theoretical analysis, and the same, we, the same result we obtained experimentally. Obviously, the two cylinders had different acceleration. Uh, the second one, which is just like a hoop, empty inside, uh, had smaller acceleration because the moment of inertia was larger, and the moment of inertia here is in denominator. And the larger this quantity, the smaller the acceleration. That's exactly what we have just observed. Well, I have just a few more minutes before the end of this lecture, and I would like to consider another simple problem uh, related to the conditions of static equilibrium of a rigid body. So the conditions of static equilibrium are indicated here in this circle. And they are very important when you analyze the static equilibrium of any body. Let's consider such a body like a uniform bar of mass m and length L, the length is given and the mass is given. And this uniform bar can rotate about this axis of rotation. It can rotate, and it's supported by a string or by a rope, which is located at angle alpha. 
So let us find the force of tension in this rope. It's tied up here to this point, and it's fastened to the vertical wall. And this body can rotate about this point, this axis of rotation. Oh. So what will be the uh, tension in the rope? OK, in order to solve this problem, we must consider, first of all, all the forces acting, all the forces mm, acting on this, on this bar. And the bar is in condition of static equilibrium. It doesn't move. And the rope doesn't break. It supports, it supports the bar. So the bar is in condition of static equilibrium. It doesn't move. It doesn't accelerate. Therefore, we must use these equations. In order to use the first equation, we must uh, consider all the forces. And we must uh, consider components of forces taken along two perpendicular axes. We may take any 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 frame of reference, any perpendicular axis. But I choose such a reference frame, which is convenient in this problem. And it's convenient to choose one axis horizontal and another axis vertical. Uh, so that the forces acting on this bar, the force mg and the force of tension in this string, string and some force acting here. I don't know what force is here. I don't even know the direction of this force. It may be any direction, like this one. I don't know the direction. It, must, it may be anything. And uh, this force may be directed, acting here. The force in this support, from the axis of rotation, the force acting on the bar, may be directed at any angle. And let us uh, denote this angle by beta. The angle of direction of this force uh, with respect to the uh, horizontal. So along the x-axis, the components of all forces along the x-axis uh, will be easily found if we, uh, if we see that the weight has no component in horizontal direction. The component of this force is 0. And only two forces will have some components. So the force n will have a horizontal component. Uh, the force n uh, will have horizontal component like n equal to n cosine beta. And this is directed to the positive direction of x-axis. And so I will take this term with a plus sign. And the horizontal component of the force t will be directed in opposite, will have opposite direction. And so I will, t I will take it with opposite sign. It will be t uh, cosine alpha, t cosine alpha. And this must be equal 0, because uh, horizontal components of all forces uh, added algebraically must give 0. Why? Because of this equation, because of this condition. Also, the same should be true if we take vertical components of all forces. And vertical components will be such that the force n will have vertical components like n sine beta, sine beta. And uh, the force t will have vertical component also positive, because vertical component will be directed upward. The force t will have vertical component like t sine alpha. And also, there will be a vertical component of the weight of the body, which will be directed downward. And so I take it with minus sign. And so it will be minus mg, and it will be 0. So I have, I have taken the first equation. Uh, the vector sum of all forces is now uh, projected into two axes. And so from one vector equation, I, I obtain two scalar equations uh, for the components of all forces. And now I will take, I will take uh, the last condition, the remaining condition for the net torque. And in order to find the torques of all forces, I have to choose some axis of rotation. And it's convenient to choose this axis as the axis of rotation. I could have certainly take this point, or this point, or any point as the axis of rotation. 
but it's convenient to I think it's convenient to take this uh, point O as the axis of rotation. And then the force mg will rotate, pretend to rotate the bar in clockwise direction. And so it will be taken with plus sign. And the force T will tend to rotate the bar in counterclockwise direction. And so its torque will be taken with minus sign. So the first of all, the torque of mg that will be mg times the arm of this force. And the arm of the force will be half the length of the bar. That is L over 2, the arm of this force. And this term is taken positive because it rotates uh, clockwise in clockwise direction. And the second term will be negative because it rotates. It tends to rotate in counterclockwise direction. And it will be what? Uh, with, res with respect to this axis, the arm of this force will be the shortest distance between the axis of rotation and the direction, the line of force action. That is uh, the shortest distance between the axis and this rope. That is uh, the length of this section. The length of this section may be uh, denoted by h, for example. And we understand that pro from this right triangle, h, the opposite leg in this right triangle divided by L by length of this bar will be uh, the sine alpha, will be just sine alpha. So H will be equal to L sine alpha. And uh, that will be the arm of the force. And so the torque of this force will be, the torque of force of tension will be equal to T times H, and H equal to L sine alpha. L sine alpha equal to 0. Why so? Why is 0 here? Because this is the main equation which tells us that the net torque should be equal to 0 so that the bar is in the body under consideration is in uh, static equilibrium. So we obtain three equations. And uh, what quantities are known in these equations and what are unknown? Angle alpha is given in this problem, and the mass is given, and certainly the acceleration of free fall is given. So mg is known, alpha is known, alpha is known, and mg is known. And L also is given. We know L. We don't know the force T. We don't know T. And we don't know N the magnitude of force and the, the length of this vector we don't know. And we don't know beta. We don't know the angle under which this force is, uh, under which this force is directed. So we have three unknown quantities. That is the tension, the force of tension, T, the magnitude of force of reaction in the axis of rotation, and angle beta, which defines the direction of, of the force N three unknown quantities and three equations which can be solved simultaneously to determine the three unknown quantities. Such is the physics of this problem. And now physics ends and mathematics starts. And the rest of solution is not physics. It's rather a mathematics. So mathematically, you can, you can solve these three equations and then obtain the solution for the three unknown quantities. So now we have come to the end of this lecture. It seems to me only one minute remains. So let us finish on this point. Goodbye, everybody.